colonist night. Doomsday looms. World leaders pledge planet protection with activists pressuring for faster action. Tense talks. France holds back sanctions for Britain, making way for further negotiations. Extended restrictions. Russia sees exponential infections despite non-working day protocols. Halloween happiness. Devotion to a unique craft helps light the way for those in need. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with urgent calls for climate action. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres greeted world leaders arriving in Glasgow for the Leaders' Summit at the start of the United Nations COP26 climate conference. It's one minute to midnight on that doomsday clock and we need to act now. A crucial UN conference on climate change opened in Glasgow, Scotland on Monday with world leaders, environmental experts and activists pleading for decisive action to halt global warming, which threatens the future of the planet. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson told the crowd at the COP26 summit that time is running out. If we don't get serious about climate change today, it will be too late for our children to do so tomorrow. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the world's addiction to fossil fuels is pushing humanity to the brink. Enough of treating nature like a toilet. We are digging our own graves. And US President Joe Biden, despite appearing to nod off for a moment in the audience and arriving without securing a key piece of climate legislation he has been pushing, robustly assured the world that the U.S. would keep its promise to slash greenhouse gas emissions by more than half by the end of the decade. We'll demonstrate to the world the United States is not only back at the table, but hopefully leading by the power of our example. COP26 aims to keep alive a target of capping global warming at 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1.5 degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels. The limit scientists say would avoid its most destructive consequences. To do that, it needs to secure more ambitious pledges to reduce emissions, lock in billions in climate financing for developing countries, and finish the rules for implementing the 2015 Paris Agreement. But in Rome over the weekend, a meeting of the G20 failed to commit to the 2050 target to halt net carbon emissions, undermining one of COP26's main goals. And outside the summit, 18-year-old climate activist Greta Thunberg said the powerful leaders were just, quote, pretending to take the future of the planet seriously. Change is not going to come from inside there. That is not leadership. This is leadership. Yeah. This is what leadership looks like. World leaders will conclude a two-day climate summit with a multi-billion dollar pledge to end deforestation by 2030, a day too far for campaigners who want action sooner to save the planet's lungs. It's the biggest pledge yet to protect the world's forests. In a joint statement issued Monday, over 100 heads of state committed to halt and reverse deforestation by 2030. Under the agreement, countries will provide some $12 billion in public funding and private investors an additional $7 billion to restore degraded land, support indigenous communities and mitigate wildfire damage. This marks the first time such a pledge is backed by tangible funding. With today's unprecedented pledges, we will have a chance to end humanity's long history as nature's conqueror and instead become its custodian. Forests represent a natural buffer against climate change and absorb roughly 30% of global CO2 emissions. Yet they've been disappearing at an alarming rate. In 2020, the world lost over 250,000 square kilometers of forests, an area larger than the UK. Monday's pledge was cautiously welcomed by climate activists and experts, yet many expressed worries over a lack of accountability and said many details, including how the money will be spent, still needed to be clarified. Some pointed to previous failed efforts to halt deforestation, like the 2014 New York Declaration on Forests, which has produced few tangible results. 
A key difference this time around could be the participation of major forested countries like Indonesia, Brazil and the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as industrial powerhouses like China. French President Emmanuel Macron said he was postponing planned trade sanctions on Britain so that negotiations with both sides could work on new proposals to defuse their dispute over post-Brexit fishing rights. A little more breathing room as the threat of French sanctions on the United Kingdom still looms after French President Emmanuel Macron opened the door to further negotiation over the ongoing fishing dispute. Since Monday afternoon, discussions have resumed on the basis of a proposal I made to Prime Minister Johnson. The talks need to continue. France wants the UK to hand licenses to EU fishermen waiting to work in the English Channel and had initially given London until Tuesday to act. Since the UK left the EU, the British decide who's entitled to fish in their waters, following conditions negotiated in the post-Brexit trade agreement. The French government says the UK hasn't stood by its commitments and is threatening to retaliate by barring British boats from French ports, among other sanctions. British authorities have urged France to retract those threats or face an escalation. If the French have behaved unfairly. You know, it's not within the terms of the trade deal. And if somebody behaves unfairly in a trade deal, you are entitled to take action against them and seek some compensatory measures. And that is what we will do if the French don't back down. The British say the only fishermen they turned away lacked the necessary paperwork. For the French, the British are demanding additional documents that small boat owners don't have. Despite several recent disputes, both leaders insist they're still close allies, though relations have remained particularly cool. The Ethiopian government accused rebellious Tigray forces for killing 100 youths in the town of town of Kombolcha as the United States expressed concern about Tigray advances a year into the fighting. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says he is alarmed by reports that forces from Ethiopia's Tigray have taken over two key towns. The Tigray People's Liberation Front said on Sunday its fighters were in control of Kombolcha and its airport, having claimed the capture of Desi the day before, which the government denied. Both are located in Amhara, which neighbours the northern Tigray region. On Monday, Ethiopia's government communication service said Tigrayan forces had summarily executed 100 youths in Kombolcha. TPLF spokesperson Geitachi Reda denied the allegation, saying there was no resistance in Kombolcha. An Ethiopian government spokesman did not immediately reply to a request for comment on Geitachi's response. Verifying such accounts is difficult, as communications to the area are down and journalists barred. Kompolchar would be a strategic gain for the Tigrayan forces in the nearly year-long conflict with the federal military and its allies. It's located on a major highway around 235 miles from Addis Ababa. If confirmed, the seizure would be the closest to the capital and the furthest south into Amhara that Tigrayan forces have reached since pushing into the region in July. Speaking on Monday, Blinken said continued fighting was prolonging a dire humanitarian crisis in northern Ethiopia. He urged all parties to cease military operations and begin a ceasefire without preconditions. Thousands have died since the conflict broke out and more than two million have been forced to flee their homes. A high-rise collapses in Lagos, Nigeria, with dozens feared trapped inside. Rescue efforts are underway in a search for construction workers caught in the wreckage. A vast pile of rubble is what remains after a high-rise building, under construction in Nigeria's commercial capital Lagos, collapsed on Monday. And fears are growing for the workers trapped inside. Several are missing. Two construction employees at the site in the affluent Ikoyi neighborhood said possibly 100 were working when the building crashed down. As I came, I see some of the pillars cracking and they are chasing it. Construction worker Eric Ntete said he just got out in time. We just reached the end of this building. The people collapsed at once. Building collapses are frequent in Nigeria, where regulations are poorly enforced and construction materials often substandard. 
It was not immediately clear what caused the collapse. The Lagos State Emergency Management Agency said heavy duty and life detection equipment had been dispatched and that first responders were at the scene. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. A majority of the U.S. Supreme Court signaled they would allow abortion providers to pursue a court challenge to the controversial Texas law that has virtually ended abortion in the nation's second largest state after six weeks of pregnancy. Last May, Texas lawmakers celebrated a success in their battle against abortion. The governor just signed into law the Heartbeat Act, or SB 8, banning abortion after only six weeks before most women know they're pregnant, virtually stopping all abortions except in cases of medical emergencies. Abortion is a constitutional right since the landmark Roe v. Wade Supreme Court ruling that prevents states from banning abortion in early pregnancy. But Texas legislators found a technique to push through their ban. The bill introduces a special scheme. The state is not the one suing those helping women to terminate their pregnancies. Instead, private citizens with no connection to the patients are called to sue clinics, for example. If they're successful, they get at least $10,000. Texas believes this shields its bill. Abortion providers and the White House were challenging the ban disagree. The president has been clear in his position that SB 8 is blatantly unconstitutional, not only violates the right to safe and legal abortion established under Roe v. Wade, but it creates a scheme to allow private citizens to interfere with that right and to evade judicial review. That is why he's directed a whole of government response to it. The case is crucial to women and it may impact other constitutional rights as well. The bill's special structure could be used in future laws to strike down, for example, the right to free speech or to own a gun. Now on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. The CDC is to discuss further on vaccination of younger children as doses of Pfizer are being rolled out by the crate. However, hesitancy looms as New York suffers under its understaffs essential care services like police stations and firefighters due to resistance to the vaccine mandate. The Pfizer vaccine for small children is out the door. The White House says shipment started as soon as the FDA recommended emergency use authorization. We expect that several million doses are already en route uh, to sites around the country. A CDC committee meets tomorrow, one of the last steps towards the EUA. I want to be able to do the things with them that we used to be able to do um, without fear that they're going to get sick or that they're going to get anybody else sick. The children at the front of the line would be fully vaccinated by Christmas, but some parents are unwavering. They don't want their kids in line at all. To me, personally, I just, I, I don't want to take the risk for them. Meanwhile, in New York City today, the clock ran out on unvaccinated city workers. No shot means no job and no paycheck. Before sunrise this morning, the heads of the FDNY union were sounding the alarm about firefighter shortages. The FDNY fire division has a vaccination rate of 77 percent, according to the city. But overall, more than 91 percent of city workers have gotten the shot. Today, there are 9,000 employees on leave without pay. According to the mayor, city services still ran smoothly. But with police officers, firefighters and sanitation workers looking at smaller crews and longer hours, many worry that won't last. Meanwhile, Russian authorities try to curb the spread of COVID-19 by closing many workplaces for paid non-working days and imposing other restrictions all over the country. For more on this, we have Abdul Darana World Union Special Correspondent Malsha Pasiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia. Malsha. Yes, Ali. Unvaccinated Moscovites over 60s have been locked down for four months and shops other than pharmacies and supermarkets must be shut until November 7. Moscow Mayor Sergei Sobyanin said on Sunday that the number of people getting the jab on the non-working period increased four to five times compared to August. 
Russia, the first nation in the world to approve a COVID-19 vaccine and then export it for more than 70 countries, is struggling to inoculate its own population and has racked up record 24 death tolls on 21 days in the past month. Hospitals in the Russian city of Oriol struggle to deal with the number of patients with COVID-19 they have to receive daily. The hospital is short of anesthetists and infectious disease specialists. Most COVID patients need oxygen support and supply is tight. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Malsha Pati Raja reporting from Kursk in Russia. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison defended his action on abandoning a $90 billion submarine contract with France a day after French President Emmanuel Macron said Morrison lied to him over the cancellation of a submarine building contract. Bolivian President Luis Arce denounced new carbon colonialism and slammed rich countries during his opening speech at the COP26 meeting in Glasgow, Scotland. The global COVID-19 pandemic death toll reached the 5 million milestone with the United States remaining the worst hit country, according to the latest data released by the Johns Hopkins University of the United States. Polls closed in South Africa's municipal elections with the ruling African National Congress hoping to avert its worst results since the end of the white minority rule. The U.S. has reiterated a complete implementation of UN Security Council sanctions on North Korea in response to recent moves by China and Russia to ease them. Israel eased international border restrictions allowing individual tourists who have received COVID-19 vaccine boosters to enter but not if more than six months have lapsed since their last dose, with some exceptions. The fight for a better quality of life continues in Germany as workers of Amazon have gone on collective strike in order to demand more reasonable pay along with safer working environment. Workers at some of Amazon's German warehouses began strike action on Monday. It's part of a long-running battle with the company over pay and conditions. The Verdi Services Union has been organising industrial action on and off since 2013. It says it called the latest strike to demand a pay rise in line with agreements it reached with the country's broader retail and mail-order industries. Verdi says workers will walk out at seven facilities over Monday and Tuesday. It didn't say how many employees were taking part in the action. In a statement, Amazon said it offered excellent pay, benefits and career opportunities. It said the strike had not had any impact on customers so far. Earlier this year, Amazon said it would guarantee a minimum wage at its German warehouses of 12 euros or almost $14 an hour. That would be in line with a level expected to be set by the country's new coalition government. And finally tonight, a young tech whiz gives his neighbourhood a dazzling way to celebrate Halloween, generously giving his time and effort to help others. As darkness closes in on South Tampa, Florida, Everybody's waiting for the night surprise. An epic Halloween light show comes alive. <laughs> Bewitching. I did not expect this. It's so cool. Bedazzling. <laughs> and casting a spooky spell. Oh, this is actually really fun. More than 16,000 LED lights that can be programmed to be any color and match the music. The mastermind behind it all, 22-year-old Sam Johnson, who started out with a small light show in his middle school cafeteria, then started lighting up the family home a few years back, teaching himself the complex software to make each year bigger and brighter. Now in its fourth year, Sam's mission has always had a deeper meaning too. So far this season, Sam's raised over $11,000 for the organization Clothes to Kids. And he'll do it all over again come Christmas. These special shows now a family tradition for so many, helping light the way for those in need. 
In case you have missed any of our stories we've aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.